Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Video Drone. Today I want to talk about an overlooked cult classic from Japan's greatest living independent auteur, Shinya Tsukamoto's yokai fever dream, Hiroko the Goblin. Long unavailable in the US, Hiroko the Goblin is one of the most neglected entries in director Shinya Tsukamoto's filmography. Tsukamoto, best known as the creator of the cyberpunk classic Tetsuo the Iron Man, boasts a unique career spanning an impressive range of brilliant films across many distinct genres. Among the few completely independent filmmakers in Japan, Tsukamoto exists largely outside the traditional film industry. He runs his own production company and writes, directs, produces, photographs, edits, designs, acts in, and even largely self-finances his own films. Working with total creative control and complete autonomy from studios, he has succeeded in crafting a body of work with a distinctive handmade quality, a series of films that all feel completely different from one another, yet at the same time part of a single whole, expressing his many different obsessions, anxieties, memories, and emotions. Hiroko the Goblin, the follow-up to his underground hit Tetsuo, and only his second film as a professional director, represents one of the few times he made a movie under contract to another studio. Based on two stories from Daijiro Morohoshi's Yokai Hunter series, the film is set mainly in a countryside schoolhouse closed for the summer. Teenage Masao, played by Masaki Kudo, wanders onto the property with some friends, looking for a girl he has a crush on who recently went missing. They discover some strange and creepy things taking place in their empty schoolyard, and by nightfall, Masao's friends are found dead, and he is literally swept up by a bumbling archaeologist named Hieda, played by Kenji Sabada. Hieda, hoping to substantiate his theories on the existence of the supernatural, has arrived in town looking for Masao's father, who may have discovered the tomb of an ancient evil spirit called Hiroko and accidentally unleashed it upon the world. Armed with some absurd ghost hunting gadgets assembled from kitchen appliances and on the brink of constant terrified hysteria, Hieda and Masao team up to defeat Hiroko and his army of possessed severed heads. Hiroko the Goblin was Tsukamoto's first time working on a studio production. Being almost entirely self-taught, he was unfamiliar with many of the industry production standards, so out of necessity, his usual hands-on approach had to be sacrificed. He relegated himself to writing and directing duties, while cinematography, editing, and many of the other roles he was used to filling himself were handled by others. This gives Hiroko a noticeably different look and feel from Tsukamoto's other work. For instance, his aggressive camera style, severe monochromatic cinematography, and turbocharged editing are restrained in favor of slower pacing, a vibrant color palette, and more composed camera work. Could this be due to the challenges the director faced in adjusting to studio working methods? Perhaps. Tsukamoto himself, however, has insisted in interviews that his choices on Hiroko were deliberate, made in an attempt to try something new and explore a different side of his personality. While Tetsuo and many of his more famous pieces come from his fears, frustrations, and anxieties, Hiroko comes from his childhood, from the boys' adventure stories and fantasy television shows he devoured as a kid. There's a feeling of nostalgia to the film, an enthusiastic, almost innocent sense of fun and adventure, which Tsukamoto twists in interesting ways through his naturally perverse and idiosyncratic sensibilities. He has an instinctual knack for mixing wildly contrasting tones in audacious and original ways. In Hiroko, he cartwheels unpredictably between melodrama, comedy, and horror. Some sequences run into slapstick, like when Hieda realizes bug spray is an effective demon repellent. 
Others stray into pleasant sentiment, only to be broken abruptly by a freakish image or a gory blood spray. Tsukamoto creates effectively unsettling moments by constantly playing these tones against each other. One of my favorites is the way Hiroko hypnotizes victims by singing them a romantic lullaby. Once they fall under the demon's spell, their minds are comforted by peaceful dreams that sweetly convince them to cut off their own heads, which they do with a contented smile and a splattery flourish. Several impressive visual moments, such as the hyperactive demon POV shots, reminiscent of Sam Raimi's Evil Dead films, call to mind the unbridled furor of Tetsuo, and the abundant special effects have a charming handmade quality, akin to Tsukamoto's more low-budgeted work. The film utilizes puppetry, animatronics, stop-motion, wires, matting, trick photography, even early digital technology, seemingly every technique available at the time to bring its indelible monsters and surreal imagery to life. In its brief 90 minutes, Hiroko packs in quite an abundance of ingenuity and enjoyably demented surprises. I remember first seeing it in high school, almost two decades ago, back when I was just beginning to discover Tsukamoto's work. I watched it late one weekend with a few friends after renting the disc through Netflix, this being the time before they were a streaming service, and movies had to be physically sent to subscribers through the mail. The film struck me with its odd atmosphere, imaginative effects, and creative visual style. It stayed with me, and I never forgot it. Sometime later, when I wanted to see it again, I decided to buy a copy of the original Fangoria release DVD, only to discover it was out of print. Prices were up in the $50, $60, and $100 range. The film seemed likely to remain a fond and distant memory. At last, a 2K restoration was completed a few years ago, and a beautiful new Blu-ray was released in the US by Mondo Macabro, a fantastic little company specializing in obscure cult gems. After all this time, I've finally been able to revisit the film in a gorgeous high-definition transfer that feels like watching it again for the first time. It's an absolute joy to at last have this underappreciated entry in Tsukamoto's filmography, available for purchase and home viewing once more. For cult cinema fans, I'd say it deserves a place right alongside similarly eccentric independent horror classics like Carnival of Souls, Phantasm, and The Evil Dead.